and I will send out a copy of the recording. It usually takes a few hours for WebEx to get it back to me, so it'll probably be tomorrow morning that you'll receive a copy of the recording from me, along with any links um, that Jasmine or Rachel want us to send out. We'll include all of that in that email message. Uh, but I'll go ahead and pass it on over to Jasmine to get us started today. Thanks so much for coming. Yes, thank you, Kristen. Thanks for having us and thanks to everyone for jumping in. I know Kristen called out a housekeeping item with just recording the session, um, but we also have a quick housekeeping housekeeping item on our end. I know Rachel, um, my team member on the call, she already dropped a link in the chat, but I know some of you have joined a sense. So I'm going to have her redrop the link in the chat, but um, this is just our attendance sheet for the day. So let's our team know who we had the opportunity to speak to um, and who was, who attended the session. So if you could take like 30 seconds and fill that out, drop your resume in there, that'd be super helpful. And um, today, we're really just going to talk to you a little bit more um, about rocket companies, share who we are, what we do, and then Rachel's going to jump in and share some tips and tricks when it comes to your resume and how to set yourself apart. So we're going to cover some good stuff. Make sure you write down any questions that you have. And then, um, like I mentioned before, we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. So we'll get the party started and introduce ourselves. Um, Rachel, do you want to? kick off with introducing yourself. Yes, yes I can. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. I am a business analyst here within Talent Acquisition at Rocket Central. Um, I'm going into what it will be my fifth year starting January uh, at the Rocket Companies. I'm very excited. This is actually the longest thing I've ever done. Uh, thinking back to my academic career, everything has always had a four year cap. So um, it's starting to feel real. I know it took five years to do it, but here I am. My entire career has been here in talent acquisition. I started as an intern, absolutely fell in love with the profession, um, but I have bounced around from recruiter to project manager, now business analyst, helping the team make more data-driven decisions and really understand where are our areas of opportunity and what are we doing and what, what um, initiatives that we implement are actually impacting us in a positive way. So um, in my position, I get to work with the lovely Jasmine Hines, who you are so lucky to, to work with, to get to work with as well. Uh, she's truly the creme de la creme of this talent relationship um, scene. So I will pass it to you, Jess. Okay, thank you. Wow, I'm blushing. Um, but Rachel and I are quite a duo, I will say that, because I know she mentioned she's been with the company for five years. I actually started as an associate essentially under her. Um, so she was my mentor um, when we both did tech recruiting and we've both gone in a lot of different directions, but it's really cool that we get to come full circle and do stuff like this still. Um, but I'll give a little bit more insight into who I am. So Jasmine Hines, a senior talent relationship manager with Rocket Companies. So I've been with the company, it'll be three years in a couple of weeks, which is exciting. It flew by, um, but I really just serve as a connector in my role. So connect individuals with those career opportunities at Rocket. Um, I'm really honing in on our full-time recruiting space, but still dabble a little bit in our internship recruiting space. So um, now that we introduce ourselves, we're going to kick off with a video that shares a little bit more about Rocket, um, showcases some of our brands in the city of Detroit, which is where we're headquartered. So it's just a quick little video, but I'm going to go ahead and play that for you all. Rocket Companies is fully committed to the city we are based in. Our passion for Detroit has developed into an obsession with building community partnerships and driving economic growth. We grew tired of seeing Michigan's young talent graduate from high school and college with diplomas and degrees and then hop on the next flight to New York, Atlanta, or San Francisco and take their expertise there. Which is why in August of 2010, Quicken Loans moved to downtown Detroit, consolidating 1,700 team members from neighboring suburbs. Today, Detroit is the hub of operations for 120 companies and 19,000 team members working together across the city's vibrant central business district. At Rocket Companies, our team members are at the forefront of everything we do, and their safety means everything. Amidst COVID-19, we successfully moved our business and team members across the nation to a work from home normal. Because our team members are dedicated and passionate about the work they do, this transition of working from home was seamless and even allowed our business to grow. We also helped create an initiative called Decked Out Detroit. This effort allowed safe and fun outdoor experiences for visitors while supporting local Detroit businesses. In 2017, Detroit launched the Q Line, 
a modern streetcar system inspired by the transit used here until the mid-1950s. And Rocket Mortgage was the lead investor in driving the initiative forward because we know firsthand how important accessible public transit is to our team and the community we serve. Rocket companies decided that if Detroit could retain and attract talent, it had to be a place where people wanted to live, work, and play. Join our team and be part of more than just an organization. Be part of a movement. Awesome. Well, I love that video. Um, just gets me so fired up because I love seeing the growth of our, you know, our headquarter, where we're headquartered, which is the city of Detroit. But um, we also have offices across the nation. So I want to dive into um, sharing a little bit more about who we are and, you know, where we're located, all that fun stuff. So we have offices in Cleveland, Ohio, Phoenix, Arizona, and some smaller locations across the country, like I mentioned, um, some of the Carolinas, DC, but across those different locations, we have thousands of team members. Um, but, you know, the core of who we are is really that rocket mortgage brand. So that's typically the brand that a lot of individuals are really familiar with because that's just the heartbeat of our company. So we're America's largest mortgage lender. Um, and ultimately, we help Americans fulfill that American dream of buying a home or even refinancing their home. So we've been in the industry, the mortgage industry for just over 35 years. But the cool thing is we're not just in the mortgage industry. We're involved of we're involved in a lot of other different industries as well. So I'm going to go ahead and show a visual of what that looks like on this slide. Um, so again, that uh, main brand in our portfolio, that Rocket Mortgage brand, you'll see in the top left under home financing. We're also involved in a lot of different areas, as you'll see on here, home sale and search, auto and personal financing, media, and then client services and technology solutions. Um, another one of our brands that I really want to call out is our Rocket Money brand, because I feel like this is one that everyone can leverage now because, um, you know, right now, not everyone's looking to buy a home and leverage that Rocket Mortgage brand, but just wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this um, brand. It's actually um, an app that you can download on your phone. So um, if you don't have it on your phone, I would definitely recommend doing it. It's formerly known as Truebill, but when we acquired it, we renamed it, rebranded it to Rocket Money. But what it does is it finds and tracks your different subscriptions. Uh, ultimately, it helps you manage your money. It empowers you to save more money, spend less, and take control of your financial life. So this is great for me because I think sometimes, you know, especially in today's world where you're not actually seeing your money, like being spent with cash, a lot of us use card or even tap to pay. Um, so it's really good um, to just have insight into where you're spending every month. I know some of my top spend is like Amazon. Um, I don't know if anyone else can relate, but that is um, one that I'm trying to be a little bit more disciplined in. So um, just wanted to call that out. So if you guys don't have it, definitely make sure um, that you download it. All right, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk just about our awards um, at a super high level, just because these are some things that we're really proud of. So I'm waiting for the slide to change. My internet might be lagging a little bit, but there we go. Um, so these are just some of the awards that we've received and that we're proud of. I'm not gonna read through them all, but I'll just call out that we've been recognized by Fortune Magazine, um, Forbes Magazine, and People Mag Magazine for a variety of things, um, for companies that care, um, best companies to work for. We're one of the best employers for diversity and for millennials. Uh, we were actually just named number two um, for best companies to work for. So all of these awards are really just a reflection of, you know, things that are important to us. So our rocket company's culture, our team members, and, you know, just our different communities are what make achievements like this possible. So I want to hone in a little bit more on our culture um, because it is a big part of who we are um, and what we do and how we do it. So um, I'm going to show a quick video that talks about our isms, which really define our company culture. Here at Rocket Companies, we pride ourselves on having a culture that's different than any other out there. While typical companies have mission statements, we have isms, which are the philosophies our team members live by that drive all our decision making. They aren't just words or simple sayings. They're the lessons we've gathered since being founded over 35 years ago, and they fuel the company culture you're bound to feel from day one. Our isms are why we invest so much in the communities we call home and the reason why we wake up ready to grow and innovate every day. How are we able to grow into one of the largest, most successful organizations based in Detroit? Easy. We have the kind of culture where our team members genuinely care about both our clients and each other. 
At Rocket Companies, we're obsessed with finding a better way, meaning our teams don't just settle for just okay or good enough because our culture motivates us to problem solve on a daily basis and to put our clients and team first. And when you have more than 24,000 team members all heading in one direction, that's when you can make a big difference. So if you're looking to grow your career at a company with a winning mindset and supportive culture, then come join our team. Learn more about our isms at myrocketcareer.com forward slash isms. Awesome. And then in that video, I always love to highlight, um, you know, we have a, an isms day. So these um, philosophies and sayings that we truly do live by, we have a whole day dedicated um, to our team members learning about these when they join our company. So it's a half day event, again, dedicated to learning about these 20 isms. You get to hear from leadership, from team members all across the company um, and, you know, why they're important to them, what their favorite isms are. Um, but here's our first 10 isms on this slide. So I'll call out one of my favorites, um, which is obsessed with finding a better way. Again, these aren't meant to be complicated. They're meant to be easy to understand, but with obsessed with finding a better way, it's really just, you know, our never ending mission at Rocket is just finding a better way for everything we do, you know, always finding new and better ways to do things and being better, um, not settling, just having that growth mindset. And sometimes you'll hear us say that we don't just work in our business, we work on our business. And here's our next 10 isms. Um, and I do want to call out one that I always get a question on, which is we eat our own dog food. So um, we don't actually eat dog food at Rocket. Um, but what this means is we have a whole portfolio of companies, right? We actually have over 100 companies in our portfolio um, that are all connected by our founder and chairman, Dan Gilbert. Um, so when we say we eat our own dog food, it's really just tying threads with these different companies and leveraging our own internal resources before essentially going external. So an example of this could be, we have a company called Threads, which makes apparel and, you know, merchandise and all types of things. So when we go to campus or we go to events and conferences, um, we wear like the shirt, like this is from Threads. So that is an example of eating our own dog food because we leverage one of our own, um, companies in our portfolio. Um, to help us be successful when we go on campus and to events and all that fun stuff. Um, so I want to switch gears and talk about something else that is really important to us, which is our for more than profit vision. Uh, I know I mentioned some of the awards we've received and you know some of the success that we've had as a company, and we want to, right? Like that's important to us, but it's also important to us to extend our reach outside of our four walls, outside of our shiny buildings. So just for sake of time, I'm just gonna call out two of these here on this slide. Um, Rocket Mortgage Demo Day. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with Shark Tank, but Rocket Mortgage Demo Day is run very similar to Shark Tank. It's an annual competition that infuses $1 million into existing Detroit businesses. So companies come in, they pitch why they should receive money from us, and then we give or invest money into the top three companies of this competition. So again, just a really fun way to give back. And then another fun way to give back is our Rocket Mortgage Classic. So this is an annual golf tournament held in Detroit every single year that raises almost $3 million for um, nonprofits. So I want to wrap up um, with just talking about some of our perks and benefits. And again, just for sake of time, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but one of the biggest perks of working at Rocket is the awesome benefits that we have from um, you know, just our benefits package with like health and dental and vision. It's all top of the line. Um, and we also have what we call the Rock Health Collective. So this is actually a well-being center just for Rocket team members. So you can get 12 free, 12 free therapy sessions um, a year through this. Um, we have access to chiropractors, physical therapists, doctors, um, and we actually can make all these appointments through an app. And again, it's just exclusive to Rocket team members. So it's really easy to get in, get out, get better. Um, and through this health collective, we also have a full service pharmacy. So um, very, very low cost options for whatever your needs are, whether it's, you know, vitamins or anything from like literally tissue boxes or like sunscreen, all of that is very, very low cost. Um, and probably like, I would argue a half or a third of the price um, if you were to go to um, just one of the local pharmacies. So just a really great benefit. And then another awesome benefit is our RAC Academy Education Benefit Program. So um, ironically, and we're super excited that uh, WGU is a part of this initiative. Um, so this really is just an opportunity for our team members to maybe further their education. Um, I know actually some team members will participate in like boot camps or all types of things, but we are really passionate about, you know, professional development and 
you know, just the opportunity for our team members to extend their career academically if that's something that they choose to do. It's not a requirement, but um, it is something that you can tap into. We actually partner with a catalog of universities, um, but we also love to offer our team members the, the choice to, you know, go wherever they feel is the best fit for them. So we also work through reimbursing um, maybe, you know, some of those other universities or programs that aren't necessarily in our already existing catalog. But I do want to tap on Kristen during this because I know she wanted to call out um, something in regards to the Rack Academy. Yes. Yeah. So we do have um, a scholarship for um, employees of Rocket. So if you are considering, you know, going to work there, uh, there is a scholarship that would then be available to you. I'll put um, the link to that in the chat as well as the link to kind of our partnerships page with Rocket so you can learn more about um, WG's partnership with them, but they are one of our partner organizations and we're so excited about that. Yes, you guys have been such a blessing to work with. So Thank you so much um, for sharing that information. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely one of our, our biggest and um, I would say best perks, but we have a ton. As you see on this slide, there's a lot listed out, but there's also a lot that's not on this slide that um, is really, really great too. So um, just for sake of time, I will hop to the next slide and just talk about some of those career opportunities um, in case you're looking for that next step in your career um, at rocket companies. I know I called out the mortgage side of things, which is essentially our sales opportunities, but we do have um, opportunities all across the board. I will say for career opportunities, we offer internships and full time roles, but um, our top four business areas are sales, technology, marketing, and HR. And you'll see um, just some of those areas listed out on the slide. So if you're interested in learning more, um, definitely visit our careers page, which is www.myrocketcareer.com. I'll drop some links in the chat. Um, but are there any questions? I know I covered a lot of information, um, but definitely want to leave room for a couple questions before I toss it over to Rachel um, to talk about resume 101 tips. And feel free to come off mute or put those questions in the chat and read them from the chat if that's easier for you. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to extend this chat. There we go. All so right. the question is how can candidates stand out in the application process? So, Rachel, I saw you kind of smile. Do you want to answer this or do you want me to? We probably have different views, actually. But Well, I was going to say that's something that we might be talking about in the next five minutes. So we can hold on to that one. And then if it's still the answer to your question, we can always circle back. I love it. Amazing. Cool. One question we always get, I know you've talked a lot about um, your, like your main office and all of the benefits of like working there. Um, do you have remote opportunities? I know that's a question a lot of our students have because we're spread out everywhere. Right. No, I definitely understand that. It really just depends on like what business area you're kind of looking to go into. I will say for our sales opportunities, for those just kind of getting their feet wet in that um, area, uh, we do prefer them to be working in, um, you know, a hybrid environment and for sure in person when they're first getting ramped up with training. Um, but I would say for you know, some of those other roles, there is some more flexibility there. I know like technology is probably one of our most flexible business areas where there are some more remote opportunities as opposed to, you know, like HR and marketing. Um, but I will say most of them do require you to be in like a hybrid working environment. But if you are the right fit for the role, I know some leaders will be very flexible um, with those working environments just because that's the way the direction, you know, of like the world is going right now with career opportunities. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. All right, Rach, it's your time to shine, girl. All right. Bear with me as I try to share my screen. You got it. Um, and while Rachel does that, I'm going to drop a couple links in the chat. I'm going to drop in our careers page in case anyone wants to poke around on there. And then for any of the new people that joined us, a couple hopped in when I was getting the ball rolling. Just want to drop our attendance sheet in there again. Um, so make sure everyone fills that out. But Rachel, I can see your screen. All right. And 
Jasmine, now, if at any point you can't see my screen, please let me know. Because what I've noticed is when you share your screen in WebEx, it doesn't give you like a like a red frame, like any right. like a Zoom or a, or a team. So that's your task for this. Okay. Um, but hello, everyone. All right, I'm going to take it away. Um, like Jasmine said, we are going to be talking about resumes today. Um, how to see down the application process, but also how to put together this very important 8 by 11 document that is truly going to serve as what you'll find your first impression without you even having to be in the room. So, like I said earlier, my name is Rachel Kipe. I am a business analyst within talent acquisition, but I wasn't always in this position. I started as an intern on the technology recruiting team at the time. I didn't even know what I wanted to do. It was in between my my junior and my senior year of my undergrad degree. I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew it wasn't corporate America. And, you know, to be frank, I really just needed an internship to graduate. Um, I was approached by a former classmate of mine who had just completed an internship. They said that she was looking for um, someone to fill her spot on her old team. It's that thought of me. Um, I was interviewing with another, uh, like another government agency at the time and ultimately chose this organization because of the connections that I was able to build through the recruiting process and just how friendly the, the team members were that I was interviewing with. I could truly see myself um, interviewing with, or uh, working at this company now, fast forward five years later, here I am, and I've held a multitude of roles. So I started as an intern, but then I worked my way into an associate recruiter, then into a specifically a campus recruiter where I was for the first two years of my career in this time, this is where the idea of this presentation was born because, like Jasmine said, we were working very diligently together, looking at over 100 resumes a day. I think in my in the entirety of my career, I've probably seen closer to 10,000 resumes. I have seen some great ones. I have seen some not so great ones. And I have seen some not so great ones that were the first impression of phenomenal candidates. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, there has got to be a playbook that everybody can use that can help you build this document that can truly reflect you and your experience and what you bring to the table, no matter what role you're applying for, no matter what your background is. So hence, beyond buzzwords. I this presentation is going to help you understand what to put onto a resume, how to how to frame it in there, where to even put it on the page, what font size to you. Just kidding, we won't get that granular today. Um uh, but we could if you want. I can I have pointers on that as well. Um just so that way you your resume isn't just buzzwords. It truly is a representation of yourself. So in this presentation, I am going to ask for a lot of participation. So get that finger ready to hit on mute I want to hear people calling, calling stuff out. There's no wrong answers in this. I will preface. So to start, first one, what is a resume? Let me hear it. Or you can put it in the chat if you're, if you're feeling it. I'll, I'll allow it. How would you define a resume? Your sales pitch to a company. Tony, I love the path you're on. Yes. What else? How else could you define it? There's a million ways, I promise. A description of your skill set. Yep, Jordan. Mm -hmm. A professional snapshot. Okay. Opportunity to show your personal branding, who you are. Yes. Yep, Dan, you got it. I'm that person that's going to that's gonna wait until I'm ready to move on. So keep them coming. I love awkward silences. Come on, one more. Who else? What else do you think? Snapshot. Love. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Just agreeing. That doesn't count. One more. Come on. What else, how else would you define a resume? Okay, I'll let it go. Um, I love this. I actually, to be completely honest, this is the most out of the box thinking about how to define a resume um, that I've ever seen, which is good. That's exactly what I want. I'm partially like, do we even need the rest of this? You guys seem like you're pretty on track. <clears throat> 
excuse me, I'm getting too excited, so I'm coughing. But Merriam-Webster defines a resume as a brief account of a person's education, qualifications, previous experience. It's typically sent with a job application. And while technically they are not wrong, I hate this, Rick. I hate this. Because truly, a resume is so much more than a brief account of your experience your education. There is, it, like we said, it's a snapshot of who you are and what you have to offer, right? Your resume truly is a list of your proudest accomplishments, the toughest learning moments you've experienced so far, skills you've mastered, things you're working on, you know, any of the projects that you've done, the works in progress you're still working on, as well as what what are you passionate about? What are you interested in, both personally and professionally? You know, and also most importantly, what do you aspire to do? Your resume truly is so much more than just a recount of the work that you've done. It can also, it has to tell a story of what, you, what you've done so far to then propel you forward and project what you can do moving forward and at that company. Your resume is the key to unlocking opportunities. It is your elevator pitch. It's your first impression in a room that you are not in. So it's very important to make it a good one. So today, we're going to talk about some hot topics, some do's and don'ts, and I'm going to give it to you straight. My one thing, I promised myself that if I ever became a recruiter when I laid awake at night hoping for that first position here, I told myself I was going to be as transparent as possible. No questions off the table. Please, if you're like, I don't know if I should ask that, that seems like a hot topic, throw it at me. Uh, we're going to talk about your talk about how to what to put on the resume and also how to format it. Where does it go? How long should it be? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Not holding back today. Starting with those do's and don'ts. <coughs> Let's dive right into the juicy part, the don'ts. Your first one, and Kristen, you might want to close your ears on this one, your GPA. I know, I know. You, you think you need it. You think that every company is like, well, I want to know, you know, how good of a student they are will directly tell us how good of an employee they will be. I don't agree. And unless I really believe that unless the job description states that it is required, I know some of the internships that I applied for at the time, they did require it. Don't put it on there because I'm sure we can all agree. We understand how sensitive that number is. You can have one bad semester, nay, no, no, one bad class that you just do not vibe with. For me, it was accounting. It's ironic. I love numbers now. But for me, it was accounting and I struggled through that class and it really did ding my GPA, even though I did my best. That does not mean that I'm not going to be a great employee in human resources. Right? Therefore, you don't necessarily need to put it because it's not going to be a real accurate representation of your potential. Also, keep in mind, no one's going to miss this. The people you're interviewing with the recruiters that you're talking to, the team that you're networking with on LinkedIn, they are most likely so far removed from academia. This is not the first thing on their mind. Nay, it's not even probably the 10th thing on their mind. So unless they ask for it, unless it's required, I don't think you need to put it. Secondly, your headshot. Now, Trust me, we all want to see you smiling up there, those pearly whites, but unfortunately, we do not live in a perfect society. And when you do include images of yourself, that can unlock an implicit, an implicit bias of a recruiter, of a hiring leader, that we don't want to negatively impact your hiring experience. We want your resume to truly represent the work that you've done and the potential that you have, regardless of what you look like, where you come from. This one's a hot topic, and it even comes with an asterisk, an objective statement. Look, if I'm going to level with you, I rarely read objective statements because let's say you are, like for me, I was a human resources student applying for a, a role in human resources. I think they knew what the objective was. But now, if I were to go back, let's say I was a human resource student, but I'm applying for like a... Like a, like a business analyst type role here, maybe it's not in research, maybe it's somewhere else. 
I would probably want to put an objective statement in there that clarified how my educational background fits in where I want to take my career. So, for example, let's say I'm in that situation. Okay, I could say human resources intern at Grand Valley State University, looking to studying human res uh, yeah studying human resources, looking to take my career analytical and help HR teams deliver products most effectively and support teams most efficiently using data. Right there, I've drawn the connection. I told you exactly why I could potentially be applying, applying for this role and why I saw it was a good fit for me and my background. Another hot topic, <clears throat> another asterisk, I don't think you need to limit yourself to one page. Just think about it, think about it, okay? The one page rule was built at a time where the only way to truly get your application across was to physically hand it to somebody at a career fair. And nobody wanted to be the one to give the recruiters a cut from the staples or having to like fold the corner over so it didn't, you know, dissipate, dissipate in their hands, which still happens to this day. Please staple um, if you're going to have more than two page, more than one page. But think about it now. Yeah, you're handing your resume off at a at a career fair, but then you're also probably going turning around to their the MyRocket career site and applying online. Where going to the next page is as simple as a click of one button. There were some resumes when I was a recruiter that I would read and I was like, "Tell me more. I want to know what did what did you do in the year prior to that." So if you have the experience to fill two pages, by all means, go for it. Especially with this group, you're probably coming from more than just a traditional experience. You probably have some education, some work, some work experience under your belt already. Showcase that. Put that on there. Don't get crazy, okay? Don't go crazy. I would say two pages is probably the most as far as I would go. Um, there are, I have seen 10 page resumes. I'm not exaggerating. I wish I was. Um, that's where it becomes too much. And then, all right, so your ability to communicate efficiently is limited. But two pages, I think is totally fine. All right, we focus on some hot topics over here. Let's talk about what you should do. Now, this first one it might shock you. Um, your name, please. Please put this on here. You would think, Rachel, obviously, well, maybe not that obviously. There have been, I've seen some resumes without a name that I've had to turn back to the candidate and say, hey, before I pass it on to my leaders, can, uh, can, you, just, can you just put your name on there real fast? And they're like, oh, my God, I thought it was in the header. Sometimes headers don't show up in PDFs, so always test out your product. The next two are uh, bundled. So we want a working phone number and a working email address. These are just the best ways to get a hold of you, I would say. Now you you'll see the emphasis on working. Um, I you want to be able to to intake communication in at least two uh, both two ways of communication. The example for this is if you're ever abroad for whatever reason, or maybe your school email that you're using gets taken away from you, you lose access from that, but you just submitted an application, at least they have another way to get to get a hold of you. My example for this is when I was a recruiter, I was hiring for an intern. Um, and there's this one specific intern that the team wanted to get in touch with. <coughs> Excuse me, I swear. My throat knows what I'm presenting. Um, and I'm calling, I'm calling, I'm calling. I'm going right to voicemail every single time. I'm turning around to my my C-suite executive, we call them Z-team, um, and saying, they're just not answering because that was all that I could. Turns out a couple months later, I get an email. Hey, Rachel, it's insert name. I was studying abroad in Spain. My phone was deactivated while I was there. I wanted to follow up and see if that role was still open. If I had just, if I had that opportunity to email that student, I would have, and I would have gotten to the bottom of it a lot quicker. So always have two ways to get a hold of you, two ways specifically that you'll see as soon as it comes in. You'll also want to put your graduation date. Now, at some point in your career, once you are way, way, way down the line, I think you can take this off. But for now, where you are at your career, if they, employers will see that you're actively enrolled in some sort of education, they have no idea what your schedule is. So they'll want to see, okay, when is this person graduating? When will they be available full time? But hey, education looks any way you want it to nowadays. What if you're available for full time 
while you're in while while you're still continuing your education. I know for myself, I went back to Michigan State and got a certificate in um, data analytics and engineering, and I that was part time. That was in the evening. I still worked full time while I did that. Hash, shout out to Rock Academy. That was how I did that. Um, what I would have done in that time <coughs> is I would have used my objective statement and said, current student at Michigan State University, available for full time looking for a business analytics type role. Right? You can use that objective statement to clarify what your availability is. So that way nobody makes assumptions about what you of when you can work. You tell them directly. And then lastly, this is going to say link to your GitHub account. If you have your link, if you have any of your projects or any of your previous work on your LinkedIn, you can link that. This is specifically for my technical people out there who might be working on some open source projects or even if you're submitting work through GitHub. You always, um, your resume can show that you can talk the talk, but accounts like this um, can show that you can walk the walk. This will then bring you to what I call the general information section. And your resume will look like this. Any One Direction fans out there? Any Harry Styles fans out there? How much time do we have? Any Taylor Swift fans out there? No? Okay, fine, just me. Got it. Uh, <laughs> so, Mr. Harry Styles, who would have thought, but he was actually an intern at Rocket, and he's so very kindly let me use his resume as an example um, for this presentation. So you'll see here in his general education section, he's got his name nice and big and bold at the top. He goes into his address, which I don't think you necessarily have to put, but Harry chose to. He actually lives at um, our office building, so he's, a, he's our neighbor. Um, and then he also has two ways to get a hold of him and then a link to his GitHub. He then very clearly states out his education, followed where followed by where he go where he went to school, what he majored in, what he minored in, and then what his expected graduation date was because he was not yet graduated, and then he put his location on there as well. Now, if you're thinking about how resume how a a wreck to recruit somebody is built. You know, the hiring leader is like, hey, I need someone to fill this position and they need to have X, Y, Z skills. So what do you think should be the next thing on your resume? Spoilers, we'll just roll right through your skills. It just makes it easier to have them up top. As a recruiter, this is the first place your eyes go. So general rule for skills, okay? You want to make it measurable. You want to make it unique to you and you have to be ready to speak to them. So there are non-technical skills like public speaking, project management, communication, um, and then there are technical skills like Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Power BI, um, JavaScript, C Sharp, things like that, right? You want to have them both on there, but for those non-technical skills, you're going to want to find a way to make them more measurable because a technical skill, you have it or you don't. But a you know a non technical non technical skill of public speaking you can say you're a public speaker all day long but truly how good are you right so you want to make it measurable and unique to you when you speak about it an example is I'm going to keep on the public speaking train um, when I was in college I had this in my resume along with probably every single other classmate of mine. Why not? It's an easy one to add on there just to be transparent. Um, but how I was able to make it measurable for me and helped me in the recruiting process for a recruiting role was I measured it in for two years of my academic career. I served on a committee where I had to give weekly updates to over 50 people for what my organization was, was working on. So I had that included having to prepare ahead of time on my updates and then delivering them in front of a group of people once a week for two years. Boom. Measurable, unique to me is my experience and I could speak to it. Now, it gets a little tricky when you're working in your technical skills because there's so many out there, right? And you could put really anything that you've ever touched ever on your resume. So what I think you should list is anything that you are currently learning, using, or have used in the past. Anything that you want to be asked about should be on your resume. For example, when I was learning, when I was learning um, Java, I hated it. 
I never want to use Java again in my entire career. It's not on my resume just because I used it. I because if somebody asks me, hey, will you use this in your next job? I would say no. So it's not on my resume. How you can speak to them, right? You always want to give a quick synopsis of your history. So maybe you're at a career fair. Maybe you get a chance to just connect with a recruiter before you get into the recruiting process. Maybe you're on LinkedIn or something. Um, I have, so I have a little equation, you can call it, of how to very high level speak to your skills when you only have limited time. It is when, where, what, why. I'll say it again. When, where. What, why, let's practice. When, how many times have you used that skill? Where, give, just pick one. Give me an example of a time that you use that skill. If as a recruiter, if I wanna know about another time, I'll ask, I promise. What, what did you use that for? We've all been a part of group projects. And yeah, we might be using a certain a certain skill or certain tool, certain platform um, as a group, but did you ever actually use it? Lastly, why? Why did you choose that one over another if you have that autonomy? If you don't, it's totally fine. This is how I would do this. Let's say the skill in question is Power BI. If I was being interviewed right now about my current role, I could say, oh yes, I use Power BI every single day in my career. I started using it every single day back in late 2021, probably around October time. Most recently, what I've been using it for is um, pulling reports on you, you pulling reports and organizing the data on job board usage. Um, so that way, our leaders in talent acquisition can understand who is sufficiently using the tool that we pay for, and are we? Do we have too many seats? Do we have too little seats? Could we use more? I chose to use Power BI over Excel to do this because I like that you can model your data and then the tables and the graphs, they can be automatically made for you based on how you model your data as opposed to Excel having to redo it over and over again. Boom, right there. Probably less than 30 seconds and I gave you, an, I gave you a full in-depth rundown of my experience with Power BI. But also that why did you choose that skill over others? What this will truly show recruiters or interviewers is that you're thinking logistically about what you're doing. You're not just, you know, hey, they've always done it this way. This is the tool that you use. Uh, it's, it shows ownership. It shows initiative. I am choosing to use this tool because I know it is the best to get this job done. If there's one thing you take away from this presentation, it is, please, when it comes to skills, do not just put something on your resume because it is on in the job description. This will only waste your own time, I promise. You can list skills in many different ways. These are my, fa my favorite two. So we got running lists and categories. Running lists are that top one, right? So just from top to left to right, what have you used? I am partial to categories. If you have the space on your page, if you're really trying to save space, you don't have enough to fill a second page, but you, you're you just like teetering on that one line that just won't stay put, Cat, running list is gonna be for you. If you need to fill space, categories is uh, one of my favorites because you can bucket it out by exactly what you need. For example, when I was a recruiter, I was recruiting for a multitude of positions. Um, I would jump from data scientist, data analyst to data engineer. So I would need to know if I was doing, if I was working with data engineers, I would know, I need to know who's worked in SQL. I could, from this list that you see on the screen, I could say, oh, I could drop right down to databases. I'd say, yep, my SQL, we're good, we'll keep moving. Um, whereas before, another one, I would kind of have to read through the list and just let my eyes guide me. Now, if you really want to get funky with it, this is my absolute favorite way to list out skills, and it's by rating yourself. But don't call out, you know, you got beginner, comfortable, skilled. I would never use the word expert because you're going to get that person in the interview whose mission for some reason, not at Rocket because we would never do this, but you're going to get that person who's like, I'm going to prove you wrong. You are not an expert in this. I am. Just, let's well, just avoid that. Let's not do that. So skilled, comfortable, beginner.
you can even take it a step further and define what do you mean by skilled, comfortable, and beginner, right? So skilled could be, you know, I've used it five times, I've used it three to four for comfortable or less than two. And then your skill section should go right under that general information section um, just to round out that um, for thinking on, um, chronologically of how we're gonna be looking at the resume. Who knew Harry Styles had Hadoop? It's a hard one. You don't see it too often anymore. Who knew? He's got it right there. I bet he's very expensive as a talent, as talent though. <laughs> so next we move into, you guessed it, the meat and potatoes of your resume, your experience. But first, it's going to be another one. I'm going to rely on you. What? How would you define experience? Come on, let me hear it. I need at least three people to respond. Things you've done. Oh, Jasmine, you don't count. But I appreciate you helping. Work, volunteer, or projects. Yes, Heather, you are on the right path there. Kristen says, things you've done relevant to the job. Oh, I like that relevant to the job added. Uh, the knowledge gained by work in the trenches. Dan, another one. Great job. All right. <clears throat> Those are my three. I won't make you. I won't sit here for too long. You guys are all right. You guys are def are defining experience perfectly, right? The it's the process of doing and seeing things that have happened to you where you gain skills and knowledge. So a lot of what we were calling out in the chat is what I would call traditional experience, right? So it's your past and present employment. So that means anything you've ever done, right? Internships, on-campus, on full-time jobs, teaching assistantships. Um, it's also a list of all the projects that you've done, academic or even personal as well. It's not listed on here, but I think that you do in your free time. I, might, I would even argue that those personal projects are more impactful than the things that you're told to do. Anything that you've done as a student, um, really, right? Are you a part of any any groups? You know, whether you're in, the, whether that's through your academic journey or maybe that's outside. There are developer communities out there. There are um, communities on LinkedIn that you can be a part of, right? Have those in there. That's all part of your traditional experience. And these are great. This is what's mainly going to make up your resume, but there is more. There are experience is a lot more than just the work that you've been paid to do or the work that you're paying to do in academia. This is what I call non-traditional experience. It's defined as the experience you gain from applying what you've learned to accomplish things that you're passionate about outside of the classroom. Now, what great philosopher wrote this? Me me. I did that. Thank you. Um, I feel very passionate about non-traditional experience as a former recruiter myself because, like I said earlier, the work that you're doing outside of when, of when you're told to is where and when you are able to tie that work back, you know, what you're learning back to what you're passionate about says so much more than the work that you're told to do or the work that you're paying to do. Um, it shows that you truly enjoy the work and you truly enjoy the industry because that is one thing nobody can teach you. Anyone can learn how to code. Anyone can read a book. Anyone can write a paper. But do you like it? That comes from in here. We can't teach that. So it's also important to put those personal projects on there. And I think that you're doing in your hobbies that are related to the job. Don't get crazy. I have seen somebody put there like, I like kayaking. And while me, your friend Rachel, I'm like, that sounds like so much fun. Where do you kayak? Sometimes if you got to save space, keep it, keep it relevant. But I have seen people who they are, you know, hobbyist engineers. They're, they're hobbyist writers. It, you know, so they might write for their job, but they also might write for a blog, for a blog outside of it. Um, we have a teammate, Jasmine and I, whose passion is social media management. She does a lot of our um, content creation, a lot of our, our copywriting on our team, but she'll also do it for people in social media. She loves managing social media accounts. She, has, she should put that on her resume. <coughs> 
no matter what type of experience that you're putting on your resume, you should always have about three to five on there and then utilize GitHub, utilize LinkedIn. Um, if you need more space, you want to put the extra project in there. You want to create more visibility into the work, to the great work that you've done. But when you're selecting them, you want to always make it the most relevant to the job that you're applying to, while also showcasing the variety in your experiences and the tools that you've used to, that you've used, and even your responsibilities that, that you've had. You want to keep it to about four to six bullets, um, no matter what. I mean, if you've been somewhere for over five years, you can probably, I would say you can, you can add a little bit more bullet points to that, but let's try to keep within four to six, just to prove that you can communicate efficiently, um, while also without sacrificing effectiveness. Um, you also want to have an even mix of that, of the traditional and non-traditional experiences, just to show that you have that variability as well. And always separate when it's a professional from when it's a personal project, just to further call it out like, hey, I'm doing this because I want to, not because I paid to. Um, for each professional experience, I would use the following format, right? Um, just one bullet point listing out your main responsibilities. Then I would go into the next three to four describing what you worked on. So include the tools that you've used in the endeavor, add the metrics that, you know, kind of that make your, your efforts measurable. And then one to two bullet points at the end, highlighting any accolades or awards that you've received in that time. A good example of this is when Harry was actually a data analytics <coughs> intern here. At Rocket, back in 2020 and 2019, right before the pandemic, so was our last fully in-person internship ever. Um, I absolutely love how he, how he framed this, right? His first bullet point describes the team that he was on, who he was reporting to, and what he was doing. The next three go into the things that he actually did while, while here as an intern. And then the last one rounds it out with the, with the amazing innovation is rewarded, execution is worshipped, one of our isms, award for and why he won that as well always tie it back to that why. For projects, it's a little bit different. I would say you want to include the title of the project and a link to it if you have it listed on the web anywhere. You also want to say that's personal or, or academic or professional. Um, you also want to have one bullet point that describes what the project aimed to do and what your role was, was in it. Were you the sole contributor or were you a part of a team? A good example of this, we'll see it in Harry's resume, um, but he served as a project manager on a soft, uh, on like a, the building of an app, right? If I'm a recruiter and here, we'll just go to it, um, that second one here, if I'm a recruiter, and I see, oh, he built this mobile app without, if he didn't have that bullet point, I'd be like, oh my God, he built it himself. That's crazy. No, keep reading. He was actually the product owner. He made sure that the engineers had all their stories straight, literally, um, in, to, build this, to build this app here. So here's a couple examples of what your projects could look right like. He's got two, he's got an academic, he's got a personal. Both of them that take that first opportunity to explain exactly what that project aimed to accomplish. And then he went into, you know, what his contributions to the project were. Now, hi, I will say with five minutes left, project experience, um, we're talking about projects. It's really good to know, not just what did, what did you contribute to the project, but to truly understand what did everyone else in that project group also contribute and how did they play a part? That shows that you're not just an individual contributor who happens to be on our project team, but you yourself are on the team, a very team-oriented mindset. And there you have it. You've got the meat and potatoes of your resume, about two-thirds. Just one section is missing, and that's your honors and award. And for this, I'm going to say simplicity is genius, another one of our isms. And let's keep it, let's keep it short and sweet to the point. If you have them, add them. If you don't, again, no one's going to be looking for them unless they're, unless they're there, then that's great. Harry has two. He was the silver medalist in the Up All Night Hackathon, and he won the Elite Member Award for his Omicron Delta fraternity. And he just sandwiched them in right at the bottom there, right as that page cut off. So there you have it. Those are my tips and tricks on how to create the perfect resume to truly stand out while also communicating your experience effectively and, and efficiently. Do you have any questions? There was a couple in the chat, Rach. Um, oh, okay. 
I know someone mentioned, I run my own small bakery. Does this count? I think when you're going over the experience section. I would say if it's relevant to the work that you're doing, um, the work that you want to be doing, the job you're applying for, definitely put it in there. I will say that is something that I would put in the background check process. You might think like, well, listen to my resume. I don't need to put it in there. Put it in there. Um, that's a place where, and I'll tell you, this isn't necessarily about like getting the job. That's after you got the job. But I will say any employment experience, put it on there. It's better to have it on there than omit it by accident. Um, aside from an intern position, are there any entry-level entry type roles within the company? Yes. So right now, the best way, our, our biggest entry-level position is our mortgage loan officers. If you are looking to start a very fruitful fruitful career in sales, then becoming a mortgage loan officer is for you. And the best part is it's paid training. So you don't have to know anything about mortgages or anything about the mortgage industry because we'll take care of that for you. You'll get you'll get all the way geared up to take the, that safe training, get your license. And then from there, we're gonna hold your hand until you're ready to, to go on the phone. And then there was another one aside from, um, I don't know if that was it. You got it. Yep. Cool. So if you're, if that's not up your alley, then definitely look at my rocket career. Um, and everything we, I will say we are very diligent with that site. Um, it's not, if you see a posting on there, it's not gonna, if it's, it's not like, oh, I just left it up there by accident. We actually have multiple team members who spend time managing the, the postings that are up there. And when we get enough applicants, we take that down. Perfect. Just put it in the chat. Perfect, perfect. And then I'll also drop, I know we're getting close to time, but if you guys have any more questions, feel free to come off mute or pop them in the chat, but I'm gonna drop our LinkedIn's in here as well, um, just in case you have any more questions for us, if you want to stay connected. I'm gonna wrap up with a, another hot topic question, which is not what we talked about today, but what are y'all's thoughts on cover letters? Hmm. Oh, wait, Rachel, I think you're on mute. Hold on. Uh, okay, I'm back. I never read a cover letter. Um, I don't think, I think that if it's, I think it's a great way to help yourself stand out. But again, if it's one of those things where like, I just don't have time to write it. Sorry, my like cups in the way, that's so rude. Um, I really, I don't think that you're putting yourself as a, at a disadvantage for not. I think what's most impactful is messaging that recruiter on LinkedIn or finding them on LinkedIn somewhere and messaging them that way and giving them just like a three sentence, like, I saw this. This is why I think I'm a great, you know, fit for it. I would love to connect. That's the new cover letter, in my opinion. Yeah, retweet that. I barely looked at cover letters, so. The resume is like the meat and potatoes of what we look at, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, well. Oh, a great question in the chat. Do y'all use ATS before you're looking over resumes? I'm guessing they mean like to filter people out before you have to look at all of the resumes. So we do, we, every company has an applicant tracking system, but what I think you're referring to is that AI that's going to re review and tell us who to reach out to. We actually don't have that. We, <laughs> for better or for worse, it's just everyone's own two eyes. Um, so I will say it does help us though, because we're, our recruiting team is really crafty in saying, Hey, like, I know that, you know, you might apply for like a software engineering internship, but maybe you are eligible for full time and maybe they know that you are, maybe you're actually better for like a data engineering role entry level. Um, our recruiters are able to, or because they're not AI, they are able to make that connection and reach out to you and propose and propose that new opportunity to you. Um, Jasmine, I do have to drop for a five. So I, but thank you all for having me. I'll let Jasmine take the rest of the questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. You did amazing. Yes, thank you, thank Rachel. You. All right, bye, cool. everyone. <laughs> All right, yeah, if there's any more questions, feel free to pop in the chat. I'll stay in another minute or so, but... Yeah, um, I'll stop yeah. the recording in case anybody doesn't want their question to be on the recording. No worries. Uh, let me get